Not sure if you've heard of the guy who bought a brand new chainsaw. He takes it home, goes to use it, and found that it worked awful. It was so slow. Disillusioned and a, and a bit angry, the next day he brings it back to the store and complains to the clerk saying, I can cut faster with a handsaw. Well, the clerk takes the saw, flips the choke on, and starts it with a roar. And the guy looks at him in shock and disbelief and exclaims, whoa, what's that noise? Can you imagine trying to use a chainsaw without starting the motor? We begin a new series this fall in the book of Ephesians. It's a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a church in the city of Ephesus in what is today southwestern Turkey. Last week, Pastor Al gave us an introduction to the fascinating circumstances around how this church is started and the kind of church it was. And this guy's experience using that chainsaw without the motor is not too different than what many of us experience with what the Apostle Paul is talking about here in our text today near the beginning of this book. Let's read it. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Now, in the original Greek uh, that this letter was, uh, was written in, verses 3 to 14 are literally one long run-on sentence. And it's deeply profound as it encompasses the past and the present and the future of God's eternal purpose for the church. And at the same time, Paul brings us into the throne room of Almighty God to display how each member of the Trinity are involved in our lives. The Trinity is the unique truth and doctrine of evangelical Christianity that teaches the one true God is three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, let's take this verse apart to explore what Paul is talking about. First, Paul talks about God. He said, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This word blessed or blessed comes from the Greek word that we get eulogy from. It's a message of praise and commendation for who a person is. In this case, it's a declaration of the goodness of God. Goodness is God's nature. God the Father not only does good things, He is good in a way and to, a, to the degree that no human can, except for Jesus Christ, who was completely human and completely God at the same time. Nothing is more appropriate for God's people than to bless Him for His great goodness in all things, whether it's pain, struggle, trials, maybe frustration or opposition, adversity, even calamity. We are to praise God because He is good in the midst of all of these things. Choosing to bless Him, no matter what we're facing, helps us get our eyes focused farther down the road, off of this world and this life, and onto eternal things. The Apostle John gives us a window into what a part of heaven will be like. Revelation 5.13 says this, and I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne, that's God the Father, and to the Lamb, that's Jesus Christ, to be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. We're going to be blessing God for eternity for all the goodness God shows to us. Well, Paul goes on. It is this God who then blesses us. Again, Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. What is blessing? Well, interestingly, it's a word I'm hearing more often in interviews on TV and in podcasts from people who don't seem to follow God at all or have any interest in Him. It means favor, protection, benefit for which we are grateful. It means something that brings well-being to us. Blessings are good things given to us or that happen to us. And Scripture says this in James 1.17, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. All good things. Anytime something good happens to us is not just because we're lucky, as a good friend of mine likes to say. It's not good karma. These things are actually gifts from God. And whether we follow Jesus Christ or not, 
it is good for us to acknowledge and bless God for any of the good things, for all of the good things that we experience in this life. But Paul is talking about here spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. Well, where is that? This is the spiritual realm that exists all around us, but few can see. It is not physical or material. The heavenly places encompass the entire supernatural realm of God, His complete domain. It's the full extent of His divine operation. So there is the heavenly realm and there is the physical realm. As people, we live in both. The physical realm is just so much easier for us to see and interact with, but that doesn't mean that the spiritual realm or the heavenly realm is any less real. Now, there's nothing wrong with wanting it all. The good things of this life and the good things, the spiritual blessings in the heavenly realm. But Paul is saying here that the best things, and I want you to catch this, the best things in life are not found in this world or the physical realm. They are found in the heavenly places. What do these spiritual blessings in heavenly places look like? Well, verse 4 to 23, which is the end of the chapter, unpacks not all of them, but many of these blessings. And we're going to pound through that list really quickly in just a minute. But before we do, there is something important that we need to understand. Paul writes here that these blessings are something that God has already given us. That phrase in verse 3, who has blessed us, notice that it's past tense. These are things that have already been given. Let me say it simply. Positionally, we have it all. We already possess these blessings. But experientially, maybe a different story. Let's take a quick overview of these spiritual blessings and see how many of them you are experiencing personally. Starting in verse 4. It says, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world. Do you realize that if you've surrendered your life to Christ, that means he chose you. Unlike perhaps the playground growing up where maybe you weren't picked until last or maybe not picked at all. At the very beginning, God chose you. You may feel rejected by those closest to you, but you are not rejected by him. You are hand picked. Your life matters. Your existence isn't an accident or a byproduct of natural selection. God has been thinking, get this, God has been thinking about your destiny before He ever said, let there be light at creation. That's incredible. Verse 4 goes on. It says, to be holy and blameless in His sight. Well, this means that you are fit to serve Him and worship Him despite your shortcomings. God enjoys when we approach Him. He gladly moves through our life to touch others, not because of our own righteousness, but because of the righteousness of Christ that He has been imputed or or attributed to us. Then it says, in love. You stand in agape love or unconditional love. You cannot earn His love. Today, you are unconditionally loved in Christ. Have you allowed yourself to receive His love? Do you need to make the following confession right now? Something like this. Jesus, I receive your unconditional love. Will you make it real? Will you make it tangible for me? In verse 5, Paul continues. says, He, God, predestined us for adoption to sonship, which includes both sons and daughters, through Jesus Christ in accordance with His pleasure and will. In other words, God has predetermined to call you His own in Christ. He has selected you to be His son or daughter. And you are part of His family. He is your father. You know, many times when parents adopt a child, they go through a selection process, making a decision on who they will and won't adopt. God already went through his decision, make his decision making process about you long ago. It was his joy, it was his pleasure to choose you as one of his children. Do you struggle with feeling unwanted? Where's that coming from? Can this truth of your adoption correct the lie of your unwantedness? 
Would you be willing to ask the Holy Spirit to make that switch inside? Well, verse 6 continues on. It says, To the praise of His glorious grace, which He has already given us in the one He loves. You are not an outcast. You are not rejected. You are not unworthy of approval. The Creator of the universe accepts you in Christ and generously pours His grace into your life. You've been relationally reconciled to God in Christ and are pleasing to God. Can you imagine what life would be like having your identity founded on who Christ thinks you are instead of what everyone else thinks? Or perhaps what that podcast running inside keeps telling you. You know, verse 7 talks about redeeming us through His, shed, His blood shed on the cross. Outside of Christ... We were slaves to sin and doomed to eternal death. We couldn't buy or we couldn't work our way out of it. The price for our freedom was the precious blood of Jesus that He spilt for us. Jesus wasn't a slave. He was already free, but He paid for our, our freedom anyways. Why do we still live sometimes like we're slaves or in bondage? Verse 7 also talks about the spiritual blessing of forgiveness of our sin. He paid our debt. And when we confess or agree that we've made a mistake, He freely forgives us. Yet how many of us struggle? And this is an honest question. How many of us struggle with shame, with guilt or condemnation? Like we just can't shake that sense of defilement inside. Why have these things become a part of our identity? This spiritual blessing in and of itself, this forgiveness, is so freeing. The peace and joy that flows from forgiveness is truly transformational for us on the inside. Verse 8 talks about how God distributes His blessing, blessings and His unmerited favor with wisdom and an understanding of who we are and what we need. This is profoundly personal to each one of us. It's like an abundant measure of grace flowing to our life like a river that will last from here until the never-ending depths of eternity. That's incredible. And then verse 9 and 10, they explore how God reveals mysteries and gives insight into His will and what's important to Him. In a fallen world of war and suffering, chaos and disease, a sinful world where bad things happen to good people, God has revealed His solution to us and how to live well even when there is calamity and there's sickness all around us. Verse 11, in Him we have obtained an inheritance. No matter what inheritance looks like for you in this life, we gain an inheritance in the kingdom of God from the one who created the whole universe. His riches are unlimited. If you think of the beauty and the complexity of creation in this world, so intricately made, imagine what the heavenly realm looks like. That's our inheritance. And in the tone of a friend of mine that lives in the South, ain't nothing in this world compares to that. It's true. I don't care how much money you make or may one day receive from your parents. Revelation 24, um, I mean, sorry, 21, describes heaven in this way. And, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Is that not a spiritual blessing better than anything this world can give? Well, if you keep reading here in Ephesians 1, Paul talks about hope where there is despair. He talks about wisdom when we are dismayed and revelation to things that we don't understand. And if you still feel unworthy or not valued, verse 18 flips this inheritance thing on us and calls us and inheritance to Jesus Christ. We are so valuable to Christ. In fact, so valuable that we are His eternal reward. Blows my mind. And then in verse 19, Paul describes God's incomparably great power for those of us who believe. If you're looking for power, he's talking about a power that is out of this world. Verse 20 and 21 uh, says that 
This is the same power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. If you're thinking knowledge gives you power, you've really become short-sighted. If you think it's money, well, that's worthless in the life to come. If you think it's position, then the stewardship of authority has become distorted within you. And if you think it comes from the dark side, Satan still falls so short of God. These other kinds of power are like an anthill compared to the Rocky Mountains. They're like a, a race between a bicycle and a motorbike. You know, the other day, it was late in the afternoon and I'm laying down for a minute. I'm feeling overwhelmed. I'm feeling discouraged. I reach out to the Holy Spirit to ask Him to minister to me in that moment. And I simply ask Him to lift this discouragement off of me and exchange this sense of being overwhelmed with hope. And He did it. I can't describe to you how He did it, but that exchange happened. Talk about a change in how I was feeling. The storm raging inside was gone. I feel peace and even excitement to go do the things I felt were overwhelming just moments before. That's this incomparably great power for us who believe. It's just a small example. 2 Peter 1.3 says this, His divine power, catch this, has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence. That experience that I was, that I had is just a small example of this divine power that God has granted us for life and godliness. You know, I haven't always looked to God's power to help me in those times, but I'm sure glad I did then. When you read through this text, you will find some pretty big words that carry rich theological meaning. But they aren't meant to just be theological terms and concepts that have little meaning to us. They form the essence of the transformation that can be expected in the kingdom of God. We are meant to experience these truths in whatever it is that we are facing. Remember what I said before we went through this list? These blessings, and many more not mentioned here, have already been given to us. You want it all? Well, positionally, you have it all. But are you experiencing it all? Perhaps it's time to explore what is in the way of these blessings becoming a reality for you. Now, in all these rich spiritual blessings, there is a caveat, and it's found in the simple phrase of two words in this text. The two words? In Christ. Let me read the whole verse now so that you can see it in context. Ephesians 1.3, Blessed be the Father, for the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, here it is, in Christ, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. What does in Christ mean? Well, it must be pretty significant for Paul to mention it 11 times in, seven verse, in these few verses. Did you hear that? 11 times in these few verses that we're going to be unpacking in the next several weeks. When we understand that our sin separates us from God, deserving eternal damnation in hell, when we understand that Jesus paid the penalty of our sin through His suffering and death on the cross, when we choose to trust God that Jesus' sacrifice pays for and forgives our sin, and we choose to surrender our, our, the leadership of our life to Him, this is called salvation. We are saved from our sin and from hell. And we, He becomes our Savior and Lord. We become a child of God and part of His eternal spiritual family. And, these, and, and there is a spiritual joining with Jesus Christ. The Scripture teaches that in that moment, we become in Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 says, he who is joined to the Lord, that's Jesus Christ, becomes one spirit with him. Now, this is very significant to get. All these spiritual blessings are not for everybody. You don't receive them just because you were born. These are only for those who trust 
Jesus for forgiveness of their sin and surrender to His leadership or lordship in their life. And when we become in Christ, get this, God looks at us differently. He actually looks at us through Jesus Christ. He no longer sees our sin. In fact, positionally, He doesn't see our sin at all. He no longer sees our brokenness and our wounding, our mistakes and failures, nor even does He see a person who is defiled and full of shame. He sees us as perfect because Jesus Christ gives us His holiness and His righteousness. They cover us like clothes. In the view of our Heavenly Father, we are perfect and dearly loved. He gives us a new identity in Christ. We become new people. We can have a new understanding of who we are and a new set of lenses through which we to, to see and interact with this world. Our identity now comes from the fact that we are loved, desired, cherished, we're valued. We now have purpose that gives us meaning and significance, a place to make a difference, a place to belong. In Christ is very significant. But it doesn't stop there. Through our union with Christ, all that He has, those in Christ have. Romans 8, verses 16 and 17 says, The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. Christ's riches are our riches. His resources, our resources, his, his righteousness is our righteousness, and His power is our power. His position is our position. Where He is, we are. His privilege is our privilege. What He is, we are. His possession is our possession. What He has, we have. And His practice is our practice. What He does, we do. We are those things, and we have those things, and we do those things by the grace of God, which never fails to work His will in through those who trust Him. So I ask you today, are you in Christ? If not, I sure hope you'll make that choice soon. If you print off the sermon notes below this video, on the back are steps that you can, you can take to become a child of God and therefore become in Christ with every spiritual blessing available to you. You too can have it all. Now, if this is all new to you and you'd like to explore this more, if you have questions about life, about God, or about the Bible, we have a great environment for you to ask your questions and wrestle with these things. It's called Alpha, and it's a safe place to, to come yourself or to bring a friend who, knows, who you know have these kinds of questions. Pastor Joy will be coming in just a minute and will share with you how you can connect with the Alpha Course here at Heartland that's happening this fall, both in person and online. If you are someone who is already in Christ, does your heart overflow with gratitude? Have you stopped to meditate on these blessings lately? You know, back to the opening illustration, all these spiritual blessings in Christ are like we've been given this chainsaw with all the power available to buck up or cut up a tree. But if we're just using it as a handsaw, we're going to be really frustrated. Are you pursuing God to experience these blessings in your life today in the midst of COVID? Or are you just being carried along by the doom, the anxiety, the pressure, the lies life in this world feeds you? Now, I'm really excited about these next several weeks as we unpack these spiritual blessings more specifically verse by verse. And I'm excited because though all of these are true of anyone who has surrendered their life to Christ, my heart is that you would experience each one for yourself, that they are real, that they're tangible, and they begin to transform you from the inside out. Well, I've left one spiritual blessing here for the end, and maybe it's the best one. You see, being in Christ also means we are a part of His visible body here in this physical realm, and that's the church. 
listen to this right at the end of the fir this first chapter of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things. Here it is. Catch this. For the benefit of the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. There is a fullness of Jesus Christ that I don't think we even fathom. I think that our best and closest connection with God, no matter how good it is, is just a, a drop in an immeasurable bucket. There is so much to God that we will spend an eternity exploring and understanding and, and still never get to the end. But this particular blessing is only discovered as we connect into His body, the church. The fullness of Christ is experienced as we connect into community. This blessing isn't available through any other means. Even though the church is not perfect and it's broken in many ways because there's people in it, it still is the only way to enter into the fullness of Jesus Christ and all that He offers us. How well are you connected into the community of Jesus Christ? Those other people who are also on the journey toward God. Because connecting in community is important to God. It's important to us. In fact, it's one of our five values, and here is our vision for it. We will live life together in small groups, knowing others and being known. We will live lives of transparency and accountability at every level, speaking the truth in love. The best way to connect into community at Heartland is by joining a small group. Our small group network is very important to us. Last year alone, we had over 1,700 people connect into about 170 groups. It's a big deal to us. And please don't hear that as self-promotion. That's to help you understand the degree that we believe this and we live it out. I'd like us to listen to what others have to say about their experience in small group, even especially during this COVID time and what it means to them. Let's listen. Really love the opportunity to connect and especially during COVID it's been a really great opportunity for me to I don't know stay connected and engage in the church community and realize that I'm not just watching church at home by myself. It's a great chance to get together with other people to share life. Without a small group I'd probably die alone in my basement. <laughs> not only is it a great place to be connecting with community and with fellow believers uh, but it's also a great place where you're able to be digging into the scripture and um, getting to have a better understanding of that. I'd say it's super easy, like people were very, people are just like super kind and it's not a problem at all to get into the community. Uh, one thing I love about small group is the snacks, they're delicious and my whole small group continues to bring them but they all eat like birds so I always have a giant stash to eat, they're so giving. It's just a great environment to be in and in just at church sometimes it's harder to get to that deeper level sometimes with friendships and i just find that when you join a small group it allows for that time to form very um very strong lifelong friendships you can't not walk in and not feel welcome uh, and that impacts you in a way that you want to keep coming back and that's exactly what it did for me this is a way of life for us here at heartland in fact we often say around here that we may not be able to care for you in times of crisis unless you are in a small group. COVID is forcing us into a new season, a new way of looking at and doing church. Our small group ministry is more important now than it ever has been. Culture can shut down our, our large group gatherings, but that's just one part of our community life. I believe I've sensed the Holy Spirit's passion and love for small groups. And our small groups, they are the church. And Christ loves the church all across the world. People cannot meet in large group. This is how they do it. God is not limited by culture and government guidelines. We as a church are alive and well thanks to our small group ministry. And as a church, we have dedicated pastoral resources to our small group network. I'd like to introduce to you our leadership team. Here's some pics, uh, some pictures of them. There's Pastor uh, Joy Cadwell. She's pastor to women. Danielle Taberge is pastor to single adults. Jordan Regeer is uh, pastor of young adults. 
Greg Mulligan is pastor to men in small groups. Craig Cadwell is pastor of Renewal Ministries. And then there's myself. Even though we aren't holding weekend services yet, at least you know our faces now and maybe who you need to connect with. Well, I'd like to pray for and commission our small group leaders. And then Pastor Joy will come and share with us how you can connect in the community by joining a small group. You know, our leaders are on the front lines. They're in the trenches. They're leading life together in small group. And we would not be the church we are without them, especially during the season of COVID. So much of their work, no one ever sees. We love these leaders. We empower them to lead effectively. And in fact, we commission them as lay pastors around here. If you're in a small group, if you are a small group leader here today, in all forms of groups that we have around Heartland, I'd like to pray for you. If you are in a small group, maybe pray along with me while you have your leader in your mind. If you're in a watching party with your group and your leaders are present with you, if you feel comfortable, would you hold up a hand towards them as we pray right now? And leaders, if you wish, you could hold your hands out like this as we pray for you. Let's pray now. Father God, we come to you in Jesus' name on behalf of these small group leaders, these lay pastors, these shepherds of your flock. Thank you for their availability to you. Thank you for their willingness to serve you. Thank you for their sacrifice as they invest into your kingdom and into the lives of the people that you have put under their care. God, we love these leaders. We value them. And so we pray for them. Would you fill them with the Holy Spirit? Would you give them a fresh sense this fall as a fresh sense of your presence as we begin. As they depend upon your power for everything that they need, Holy Spirit, would you rush in giving them what they need for life and for godliness and, and uh, whatever the, the ministry will demand of them, will ask of them to minister to their people. God, we love these leaders. And so now as a church, we commission them and we bless them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, here's Pastor Joy.